Hearing the right thing means concentration on God. Angel details. A dishonest king of Judah. And ancient ruins on Mars. All of this and more coming up next on Quick Study. Stay there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study, a program designed to take you through the Bible in one year. Today, we're doing it. We're going into the Bible. Our reading today is Isaiah 5 through 8. We're looking at 6, 1 to 8. Hearing the right thing means listening to the music of angels. What does that mean? That and more coming up in just a moment. Corey is here, though, to tell us what she's going to do. Well, I'm going to be focusing on Isaiah chapter 7, where King Ahaz of Judah made some secret deals. All right, Isaiah 6 and Isaiah 7, and Ryan is here with what's going on up there. Well, there's been a lot of speculation that there's evidence of past and present life on Mars. Some even claim that there are ancient ruins there. More on that coming up a little later. And Janice is here with the question of the day. I'd like to know... How many wings do seraphim have? All right, so that and more is your question for today as we continue in this series. Stay there as we continue. Now let's get ready for Corey. person in history leaves some sort of a trail behind them when they die. But some make more of an impact than others. Right now, you and I are taking a look at the impact of King Ahaz. King Ahaz of Judah was not a good king. His 16-year reign in Judah coincided with a famous king of Assyria, Tiglath-Pileser III, who brought Assyria's power to dominance in the ancient world. Second Kings, Chronicles, and Isaiah record a world trying to resist this Assyrian threat. Northern Israel allied themselves with Aram and began to fight against Judah, trying to attain more territory and wealth to hold back Assyria's armies. This is when the prophet Isaiah enters. Isaiah chapter 7 has Isaiah confronting Ahaz, promising God's rescue and telling Ahaz to test the Lord's ability to save. But Ahaz refuses. This was not piety. Kings and Chronicles have already told us of Ahaz's activities. He had been trying to accumulate spiritual power by sacrificing one of his sons to a pagan god. He had set up whole systems of pagan worship and had even secretly sent word to Assyria in hopes of positioning Judah as loyal subjects of this new empire, worthy of being trusted and left alone. The Bible tells us this plan ultimately failed. Tiglath-Pileser did save Judah from the Aram-Israel alliance, but he then turned and exacted a staggering amount of tribute. Today, we have documentation of Ahaz's reign. A seal impression from a servant of Ahaz has been found. And recently, an impression from Ahaz's own royal seal has been identified. It reads, Belonging to Ahaz, son of Jotham, king of Judah. On the back of the impression, the outline of the papyrus document it sealed, now long decayed, can be clearly seen. 
There is even a partial fingerprint preserved. To those paying attention to the singing, we can hear the sounds, even the souls of the angels. These sounds are created by beings from another universe, but in sync with the same. They are cueing visionaries anxious to hear the sound of the soul, but their cues are important. Angels are highlighted given patterns of praise, and we see angels being cued to the fast and the furious response. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. These sounds are real and they are right and they are righteous. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. This is Bible Discovery TV and Quick Study, and I'm Rod Hembry, and I'm glad you decided to join us today. Now, we land in a very interesting passage of Scripture. It is an interesting passage because it talks about Isaiah. Now, this is an uh, interesting approach as we focus in on this, and it's something we need to pay attention to. Isaiah quotes the angels, and the angels are given a, a, a voice across time and across space that is pretty hard to duplicate. In fact, it's pretty unique, and so we see that. Now, here is the overview. A strong proclamation is the name. And our reading assignments are Isaiah chapter 5 through 8, a very important passage of Scripture. If you're reading the Super Guide, then you're going to be taking that to heart. But today on the television program, our focus is Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Now, this is an interesting passage. And as we look at this passage, we understand what Isaiah is attempting to do for this segment. And so let's take a look now at the first scripture as we focus on this, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. Now the Bible says that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his temple, or his uh, robe rather, filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Here we have angels that are sitting there, and he calls them seraphim. Now that's an interesting passage, because what is a seraphim? 
Well, the angels had two wings down covering his feet, had two wings covering up here, and had two wings out. He was a, uh, a, a image of a cross, if you can imagine that. And that's an amazing thing to see. But it also reports to us that there's something different about this passage, which tells me seeing the right thing means observing the times and the places and being willing to listen. Now, this is important because the prophecy is interesting, but are we listening to the prophecy or are we just looking at the special effects and all of the things that are involved? Now, it's important because we need to listen to the prophecy. So with that, we come back then to the scripture, which says this, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. And one cried to the other. He said, holy, 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 three times, is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Now, isn't that interesting? So here we have a statement being made by an angel being proclaimed in front of the throne to the throne, a very interesting point. Holy, holy, holy. I mean, that's three holies right there. Well, I mean, it gets really interesting. And so we come then to the point, which is this. Hearing the right thing means listening to the music of angels and doing what they say. Now, it's important to understand <laughs> that you're doing what they say. Now, I, I mean, a lot of people listen to angels and a lot of people listen to different things. But the question is, do they actually do what the Savior says? Do they actually understand what the angel says and what the proclamation is? Or are they just impressed with the, the, you know, the whiz bang and the lights and all of that stuff? But beloved, we must do what God tells us to do. We must hear what God tells us to listen to and we must do it and fulfill it. And so it's important for us to understand that we have to do what God says because he's making a statement. Now, we come then to chapter six, verse five. Now, this is an important passage for all of us because it talks about some things that we need to hear. Now, when we look at this passage, we understand that this passage deals with it in a very specific way. So I said, that's what Isaiah said. So I said, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts. What is the reaction here? Now to the reaction of this holiness, well, Isaiah says, I am undone because I'm a man. I'm comparing myself and my state with the state of holiness and I cannot make the restitution. And so that becomes very important to look at as we consider this last point of God. And that is this, saying the right thing means acknowledging the truth about your sins. Now, the truth about your sins, beloved, is that you are already in a sin-cursed world. You are not in the place of holiness. You cannot understand holiness. We cannot understand holiness. We are brought down. Jesus Christ has lifted us up, but we must remember that we are still under the unholy uh, curse. And so it becomes important for us to understand when we pray and when we look at God until the time comes correctly, that the unholiness draws on us. We must make a difference and see the unholiness and then see the holiness and say, Lord, I am unholy. You have made me holy. Help me understand that. And when Jesus Christ is seen by us and when Jesus Christ is seen to us, to make us holy from the unholiness, then we understand who Jesus Christ is. And so I encourage you today, consider Jesus Christ.
on in the program, you and I took a look at King Ahaz, who made some deals with the nation of Assyria. But now we're going to follow through with the history of Assyria and how they came against northern Israel. The nation of Assyria grew to be the destructive force used by God to tear down the northern kingdom of Israel. Rising from the common history of times of strength and weaknesses, a usurper to the throne of Assyria managed to restart a legacy of ruthlessness and strength in battle. The usurper's name was Pul. But when making his move for the throne, he changed it to a royal name, Tiglath-Pileser III. Tiglath-Pileser first secured his own land, Assyria, and then he subdued and befriended the southern kingdom of Babylon. With this new security and support, Tiglath-Pileser pushed the boundaries of Assyria. He is paid off by King Menahem of Israel and King Ahaz of Judah, but he eventually takes much of their land also. The next king of Assyria, Shalmaneser V, does not live up to his father's fame. His most notable dealings are a five-year besieging of Tyre and his famous siege of Samaria because of the rebellion of King Hoshea, recorded in 2 Kings 17. It appears as if Shalmaneser V does not get a chance to complete his sieges. He dies suddenly probably murdered by his successor and younger brother, Sargon II. Sargon II not only regains the respect of his people, but he finishes the sieges of Shalmaneser and destroys Samaria, deporting the residents of northern Israel. Sargon II survives in history as the king that extended the reach of Assyria in all directions, from the island of Cyprus to Ethiopia, from Babylon to the northern mountains. Sargon dominated and killed many, but even he could not escape death. He left his kingdom to a vengeful son, King Sennacherib. How accurate is the Bible's history? Can we trust the Old Testament when it describes the kings of Israel? What are the archaeological discoveries that have opened up the world of the Bible, and how should we understand them? Join Rod Hembry and Corey Hembry Babechko as they discover the world of the Bible. In episode one, Rod and Corey will explore the reasons behind Israelite kingship. They will search out and explain archaeological finds that display the accuracy of the Old Testament. They will show you records from Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon that reflect biblical events. And they will show you the ancient signatures of some of Israel's most influential kings. Discovering the World of the Bible, Episode 1, is offered to you for a donation of $25 or more. If you would like to receive your copy, write to us in Canada and around the world at P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2, or call us at 519-940-8338. In the United States, write to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 156. 6680150 or call us at 724-733-8336 Rod Hembry here along with Janice, and we're talking about the Quick Study television program. You've stayed with us. Thank you. And next time on the Quick Study program, we're talking about Amos chapter 6 through 9. Amos is God's angry man. Listening to the right things means confronting the kingdom that you're prophesying against. That and more coming up next time on Quick Study. Stay there. It's time for Rye the Science Guy with Cosmic Mysteries. Some have made the amazing claim that there's actually remains of an ancient civilization on Mars. Now, photos seem to reveal ancient pyramids and a face on Mars. But what is the truth behind all of this? It was July 1st, 1976, when NASA's Viking 1 was photographing an area on Mars called Cydonia. One of its objectives was to scout for eventual landing sites for future manned missions. 
The photos taken, however, revealed something else. Cydonia appeared to have some unusual features, one of which was an object roughly 1.9 kilometers by 2.6 kilometers that had the appearance of a human face with some sort of ceremonial headdress. Other photos even revealed pyramid-shaped objects. The media immediately jumped on this bandwagon parading around this face on Mars. It was Richard Hoagland, a self-promoting science advisor, and the man who assisted TV news reporter Walter Cronkite during the Apollo missions, who then began heading up and promoting the idea of an ancient alien civilization on Mars. In 1987, Hoagland published a book entitled The Monuments of Mars, A City on the Edge of Forever, in which he entitles the area of Cydonia the city square. He goes even further by claiming that intelligent races also once existed on our moon, as well as on the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. With the explosion of the UFO phenomenon in the 80s, these were not hard ideas to sell. Yet interestingly, NASA neither subscribed to these claims then, nor do they subscribe to them now. Of course, when NASA tried to con speculation, it just added more fuel to the fire of conspiracy theorists. They claimed that NASA was covering up the truth about the whole UFO phenomenon. However, it is important to remember that space agencies like NASA are evolutionary-based organizations and would love nothing more than to find evidence for advanced alien civilizations. Perhaps then they deny these claims because there is no real evidence. Indeed, in 1998, NASA's Mars Global Surveyor took new different angle, higher resolution shots of Cydonia. These new pictures revealed that the face and pyramids were nothing more than natural land formations. If this was not enough, even more recent photos of Cydonia, at the highest resolution ever taken, were sent back from the European Space Agency's Mars Express probe. These photos were responsible for completely debunking all claims. But many still believe that NASA was covering up the truth. In fact, Gerhard Newcomb, the chief investigator for the Mars Express camera, claims that he got hundreds of emails asking for the new photos of Cydonia. Some even said, NASA is lying, we want the truth. So Newcomb released the photos, and then the conspiracy theorists went quiet. So what is the cause of these natural landforms? Evidence for past and possibly even present geologic occurrences have been observed. For example, Mars has mountains and volcanoes. In fact, as far as we know, Mars has the largest volcano in the entire solar system. It is called Olympus Mons. Mars also has networks of channels and canyons, which strongly suggest past water flow. Indeed, many astronomers even believe that Mars once had a near-global flood. This geologic activity is an easy explanation for the landforms we see on Mars. However, the speculation of life on Mars, and elsewhere for that matter, has not stopped. In 2008, when the NASA rover Spirit returned a picture of what appeared to be a human figure sitting down and pointing, the media again promoted speculation of intelligent life on Mars. NASA again criticized these claims, explaining that it was a rock only a few yards away from the camera, no more than a few inches high. In all of the searching done on Mars over the years, there has not been a single shred of definitive evidence that life does exist or did exist there. You know, we should be careful to not get caught up in these things too much. It's important to investigate a matter thoroughly rather than just believing everything you hear. Each of us are responsible to seek out the truth for ourselves. All right, thank you, Ryan. That's very interesting. So we'll talk about more of that next time on the mm -hmm. Quick Study program, and it's going to be interesting when he goes on uh, to that. But right now, let's take a look at the question. Yes. Do you know how many wings seraphim have? All right, Corey. How many wings do the seraphim have? Okay, I believe that the answer is six. Six wings. You're right. Isaiah 6 Verse 2 says, Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And if you didn't know, seraphim is a plural word. What does that mean? It means more than one. Okay. And it's, it literally means the burning ones. The seraphim are the burning ones? Yes. Really? Really. So they're angels that are considered the burning ones. Mm -hmm. So that's why Isaiah said the seraphim were there, and he, and, and, and he brought he him a, a burning coal uh, yes. from the altar uh -huh. and touched his mouth. Yes. And it said that, well, his mouth was clean because right. it had burned it off. Mm -hmm. Well, I would wonder what his mouth would be like if it wasn't clean. Very good. Well, listen, let me tell you, we have some addresses for you. Rod at the, at the, at Rod at the stream TV .com or at Rod TV. That's R-O-D underscore TV. That is the Twitter address. 
Now, if you want to find out more of what's going on, then check it out. For Facebook, you're going to search Charles R. Hembry. That's my name. And then for the regular address, P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. see our sin and the way we see God's kingdom is important. The sin nature runs deep in our thinking. We cannot even come into the presence of God and think correctly. The first thing we must do is to be right with God and yield our thinking to truth. Then we can navigate forward in responding to the truth. There is great power at work for each of us if we learn to lean on the lessons of the Lord as we search out the spiritual world. We must be careful to assume what is lost and confess it. There is great strength for living once we move beyond our own accounting. So we pray, Lord, teach me to follow your help by allowing me to see the sin for myself. Our Strength in Your Mind segment says this. It's a good question. Where? Does the Bible say to meditate within your heart, on your bed, and be still about the things of God? If you think you know the answer, then go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on Strengthen Your Mind. When you get there, it'll take you to a page where we have all of the various uh, titles and all that. It's good. Also on your letter, when you get your letter, check it out. It's there. Now, I want to encourage you to come to Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ has made himself real. And I want to encourage you to, to acknowledge him and to say, that, Lord, uh, I don't know, man. I believe that you're, you're, you're Lord of my life. And I believe that you're my God. And, and I believe that you died on the cross and you rose again. And, and I decide to come to you today. And I decide and I choose to make you who I need. You are my Savior. And I need a Savior today. So, Lord, in Jesus' name, I come to you. And when you make that prayer serious, he'll change it. Uncover the amazing jewels and discoveries of ancient archaeology and the Bible. Learn from Corey Hembry at Bible Discovery Seminary and College online. For more information, go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on Bible Courses.